Can I do it? Yes. Do I enjoy doing it? Still no. <laughs> Greetings, friends. Brandar has returned from the void. And what a lovely night it was as well. I had a dream. Sneaking through the badlands of elsewhere. Hiding in the sand. Pouncing upon unsuspecting bandits. <laughs> It was quite lovely it was, and I think it has uh, expanded my mind in at least some way, hmm? Yes, we shall see exactly what it has done for me. Hmm, but only time will tell, yes? <laughs> Regardless, uh, I've been looking through my bag just a little bit as I awoke, and so many books do I have. I've been collecting them for so long with a uh, intention of reading them, but so far I have uh, not done so. So I think today Mr. Hunter might uh, enjoy some reading material as a sort of payment for him allowing me to use his bed. Whether he uh, agreed that to that or not, I, I can't really tell you. I was uh, asleep. A good couple of hours, you know. The sun is still high in the sky, we've still got some daylight left. And what better way to use it than a bit of reading, hmm, friends? I'm sure I've picked up something interesting, yes? Let us see, bar journal. Hmm, yes, indeed. I know much about barding. Tell me something uh, else that I might be interested in, hmm? Darkest Darkness. Yes, not very valuable, but uh, quite an intriguing title, I would say. Let us see. By Anonymous. Ooh, one of my favorite writers, to be sure. <laughs> in Morrowind, both worshippers and sorcerers summon Lesser Daedra and Bound Daedra as servants and instruments. Most Daedric servants can be summoned by sorcerers only for brief periods within the most fragile and tenuous frameworks of command and binding. This fortunately limits their capacity for mischief, though in only a few minutes most of these servants can do terrible harm to their summoners as well as their enemies. Worshippers may bind other Daedric servants to this plane through rituals and pacts. Such arrangements result in the Daedric servant remaining on this plane indefinitely, or at least until their bodily manifestations on this plane are destroyed precipitating their supernatural essences back to oblivion. Whenever Daedra are encountered at Daedric ruins or in tombs, they are almost invariably long-term visitors to our plane. Likewise, lesser entities bound by their Daedra lords into weapons and armor may be summoned for brief periods, or may persist indefinitely, so long as they're not destroyed or banished. The class of bound weapons and bound armor summoned by temple followers and conjurers are examples of short-term bindings. Daedric artifacts like Maroon's Razor and the Mask of Clavicus Vile are examples of long-term bindings. The temp Tribunal Temple of Morrowind has incorporated the veneration of Daedra as lesser spirits subservient to the immortal Almsibi, the triune godhead of Almalexia, Salt Salt of Sil, and Vivek. These subordinate Daedra are divided into the good Daedra and the bad Daedra. The good Daedra have willingly submitted to the authority of Almsivi. The bad Daedra are rebels who defy Almsivi, treacherous kin who are more often adversaries than allies. The good Daedra are both Thaya, Azura, and Mafala. The hungers of powerful and violent lesser Daedra associated with both Boathaya, the father of plots, plots, secrets, and lies. Yes. A sinuous, long-limbed, long-tailed creature with a beast skull head noted for its paralyzing touch and its ability to disintegrate weapons and armor. The Winged Twilight is a messenger of Azura, goddess of dawn and dust. Winged and Twilight represent the feral harpies of the West, though the feminine aspects of the Winged Twilights are more ravishing, and their long, sharp hooked tails are immeasurably more deadly. Spider Daedra are the servants of Mafala taking the form of spider-humanoid centaurs with a naked upper head, torso, and arms of human proportions, mounted on the eight legs and armored carapace of a giant spider. Hmm. I recall seeing something like this. Perhaps in another life. Unfortunately, these dangers are so fierce and irrational that they cannot be trusted to heed the commands of the spinner. 
As a consequence, few sorcerers are willing to either summon or bind such creatures in Morrowind. The Bad Daedra are Mehrunes Dagon, Malakath, Shea Gorath, and Molag Bal. Three lesser Daedra are associated with Mehrunes Dagon. The agile and pesky Scamp, the ferocious and beast-like Clanfear, and the noble and deadly Dramora. The crocodile-headed Daedra, called the Daedrith, is a servant of Molag Bal, while the giant but dull-witted Ogrim is a servant of Malakath. Shea Gorath's lesser Daedra, the golden saint, a half-clothed human female in appearance, is highly resistant to magic and is also a dangerous spellcaster. Another type of lesser Daedra often encountered in Morrowind is the Atronarch, or Elemental Daedra. Atronarchs have no binding kinship or alignments with the Daedra lords, serving one realm or the other at whim, shifting sides according to seduction, compulsion, or opportunity. Yes, we've seen quite a few of these clan fears and scamps, a uh, few Dramora as well. Hmm. But overall, uh, I know not much of these things. Brandar might like to see a golden saint, the half-clothed human female. <laughs> I wonder which half. <laughs> uh, we've also seen uh, a few of these Aetronax, but Brandar fears none of these things. Hmm. Quite nice to read about, but uh, I don't think I shall be holding on to this any longer, hmm? Goodbye. Keep it out of the fire. Thank you so much. Let us see what else we might have here, hmm? Immortal Blood. Yes, Lost Legends. My goodness. Nords, arise. Yes, tell me some more about this uprising in Skyrim. Pushing back the elves, they are. I find that quite admirable, yes. Oh, this was also written by Anonymous, my goodness. He is such a prolific writer, let me tell you. Anyways. Nords, arise. Throw off the shackles of imperial oppression. Do not bow to the yoke of a false emperor. Be true to your blood, to your homeland. The Empire tells us we cannot worship Holy Talos. How can man set aside a god? How can a true Nord of Skyrim cast aside the god that rose from our own heartland? Mighty Tiber Septim, himself the first emperor, conqueror of all Tamriel, ascended to godhood to sit at the right hand of Akatosh. Tiber Septim, a true son of Skyrim, born in the land of snow and blood, bred to the honor of our people, is now Talos, god of might and honor. The Empire has no right to tell us we cannot worship him. Our own High King Tore betrayed us to the Empire. He traded our god for peace. He agreed to a pact with the Salmo Thalmor signed by an Emperor in a foreign land. Are we beholden to such a pact? No! A thousand times no! Do not let the lessons of history go unheeded. The Aldermary Dominion and its Thalmor masters made war upon men, just as the Elves made war upon Ysgrimor and our people in ancient times. Shining Sarthal was burned to the ground, reduced to ruins and rubble in their treacherous assault. But Ysgrimor and his sons gathered the five hundred companions and made war upon the elves, casting them out of Skyrim. In the great war fought by our fathers, the elves again betrayed men by attacking us unprovoked. The Dominion and the Thalmor cannot be trusted. Like Ysgrimor, Ulfric Stormcloak is a true hero of Skyrim. His name will ring in Sovereign Guard for generations to come. Only he had the courage to single out King Torig and challenge him to trial by arms. Ulfric Thum, a gift from Talos himself, struck down this traitor's ruler, and by his death we are now free from our Imperial shackles and the Thalmor overlords that darken the Imperial throne. The Empire sent its legions to govern us. They've enlisted our own countrymen to their cause. They've set brother against brother, father against son. They've caused Skyrim to battle itself in their name, for their cause. Do not let them divide us. Do not let them conquer us. Reject the Imperial Law that forbids the worship of Talos. Join Ulfric Stormcloak and his cause. And so I have, friends. I... I cannot say that I am, uh, so fond of the way these Nords treat outsiders, but their passion is admirable, to be sure. And, uh, as one knows quite surely, I am no friend of the Empire, having seen all of the damage that they have done. Hmm, I shall leave this here. Perhaps this, uh, 
this hunter shall have a little read of it. I don't know if she's a Nord or not. Pardon me, are you Nord? Eh. The Nords, you see, they don't answer. That's that's a yes. Silence is a yes. Because she doesn't want to talk to me. Ah. At least I have some friends within the Stormcloaks, yes? I suppose. I do suppose. Ah. Should we learn a bit about uh, our bow? A bit about thieving, perhaps? Hmm. Yes, I would like a, a marksmanship lesson as well. We are quite, quite readers today, friends. We're doing quite a good job. I'm going to clear some of this out, hmm? Let us see. The marksmanship lesson by Ala Lyleth. Oh, it's not by Anonymous, but I'm sure it's still going to be good. Super good. Let's check it out. Kelmer Bryn had definite opinions on how things should be done. Every slave he bought, bought on the day he bought him or her was soundly whipped in the courtyard for a period of one to three hours depending on, on the individual decree of independent spirits. My goodness, he doesn't seem like a very nice man, this Kelmer Bryn. This slave did nothing except be purchased. He, wait for him to defy you or some such first. Ah, anyways. The whip he used, or had his castellian use, was of wet, knotted cloth, which regularly drew blood, but was very se but very seldom maimed. To his great personal satisfaction and personal pride, few slaves ever needed to be whipped more than once. The memory of their first day and the sight and sound of every subsequent slave's first day stayed with them throughout the rest of their lives. When Bryn bought his first Bosber slave, he ordered his castellian to whip him for only an hour. The creature which Bryn had named Dob seemed much more delicate than the Argonians and Kajidian orcs who made up the bulk of his slaves. Dob was clearly ill-suited to work in the mines or in the fields, but he seemed pre presentable enough for domestic service. Dob did his job quietly and tolerably well. Bryn occasionally had to correct him by refusing him food, but the punishment was never needed to go further. Whenever guests arrived at the plantation, the sight of the exotic and elegant addition to Bryn's household staff always impressed them. Here, you, said Genthath, Illoch, a minor but still noble member of the house in Orderil, as Dodd presented her with a glass of wine. Were you bored a slave? No, Sidora, Dodd answered with a bow. I used to rob nice ladies like you on the road. <laughs> The company all laughed with delight, but Kelner O'Brien checked with the slave trader from whom he had bought Dob and found that that story was true. The Bosmer had been a highwayman, though not one of any great notoriety, before he had been caught and sold into slavery as, as a punishment. It seemed so extraordinary that a quiet fellow like Dob, who always looked respectfully downwards at the sight of his superiors, could have been a criminal. Bryn made up his mind to question the, the Bosmer about it. You must have used some sort of weapon when you were robbing all those pilgrims and merchants, Bryn grinned as he watched Dob mop. Yes, Sidora, Dob replied humbly. A bow. Of course, you Bosmeri are supposed to be very handy with those, Bryn thought a moment and then asked. A bit of a marksman, were you? Dob nodded humbly. You will tutor my son Wodelik in archery, the master said after another moment's pause. Wodelik was twelve years old and had been rather sadly spoiled by his mother, Bryn's late wife. The boy was useless at swordplay, fearful of being cut. He embarrassed his father's pride, but the personality defect seemed ideally suited to the bow. Bryn had his Castellian purchase a finely wrought bow, several quivers of arrows, and ordered targets to be set up in the wildflower field next to the plantation house. In a few days' time, the lessons began. For the first few days, the master watched Wodelik and Dob to be certain that the slave knew how to teach. He was pleased to see that the boy learned the grips and the different stances. Business concerns, however, had to take precedence. Bryn only had time to see to it that the lessons were continuing, but not how well they were progressing. It was a month time before the issue was re-examined. Bryn and his castellan were reviewing the plantation's earnings and expensive, and they had come to the area of miscellaneous household costs. You might also check to see how many targets in the field need to be repaired. I have already anticipated that, Sidora, replied the Castellan. They're in pristine condition. How is that possible? Bryn shook his head. I've seen targets fall apart after only a few good shots. There shouldn't be anything left after a month's worth of lessons. 
There are no holes at any of the targets, Sodora. See for yourself. Hmm. As it happened at that hour, the marksmanship lesson was underway. Bryn walked across the field watching Dob guide Wodelik's arm as the boy took aim at the sky. The arrow flew up in an arc over the top of the target, burying itself in the ground. Bryn examined the target and found it to be, as his castle had said, in pristine condition. No arrow had touched it. Master Wodelik, you must put your right arm down further, Dob was saying, and the follow-through is essential if you expect your arrow to gain any height. Height? Bryn snarled. What about accuracy? Unless he's been secretly racking up on a high, a high kill ratio on birds, you haven't taught my son a thing about marksmanship. Dob bowed humbly. Sidora, first Master Wodelik must become comfortable with the weapon before he need to worry about accuracy. In Valen would we learn by watching the bolt arc at different levels and different winds before we try very hard to strike targets. Bryn's face turned purple with fury. I'm not a fool! I should have known not to trust a slave with my boy's education! The master grabbed Dob and shoved him towards the plantation house. Dob, head down, began the humble shuffling walk he had learned throughout his domestic duties. Wodelik, tears streaming down his face, tried to follow. You stay and practice, roared his father. Try aiming at the target itself and not in the sky. You're not coming back into the house until there's one hole in that damn bullseye. The boy tearfully returned to practice while Bryn brought Dob into the courtyard and called for his whip. Dob suddenly broke away and scrambled to hide between some barrels in the center of the yard. Take your punishment, slave. I should have never shown you mercy the day I bought you. Bryn bellowed, bringing the whip down on Dob's exposed back again and again. I have to toughen you up. There will be no more soft jobs as tutor and valet in your future. Wodelik's plaintive yell drifted in from the meadow. I can't! Father, I can't hit it! Master Wodelik! Dob cried back as loud as he could, his voice shaking with pain. Keep your left arm straight and aim slightly east. The wind has changed. Stop confusing my son! Bryn screamed. You'll be in the salt rice fields if I don't beat you to death first like you deserve! Dob, the boy wailed far away. I still can't hit it. Master Wonlick, take four steps back. Aim east and don't be afraid of the height. Dob tore away from the barrels hiding under a cart near the wall. Bryn pursued him, raining down blows. The boy's arrow sailed high over the target and kept climbing, reaching a pinnacle at the edge of the plantation house before coming down in a magnificent arc. Bryn tasted the blood before he realized he'd been hit. Gingerly, he raised his hands and felt the arrowhead protruding out of the back of his neck. He looked at Dob crouching under the wagon, and thought he saw just a sm thin smile cross the slave's lips. For just an instant, before he died, Bryn saw the face of the rogue highwayman on Dob. Bullseye, Master Wodlick, Dob crowed. The boy killed his father for beating a slave? That seems quite uncouth, does it not, friends? Hmm. I don't like this story very much. You know, you, you can't trust the elves. I tell you this now. I have great respect for Valenwood. I think that they should be allowed to live their life without the uh, Khajiit interfering, as our main has uh, tended to do in the past. But um, that does not mean they should be invited into your home, trusted with weapons and the like. <laughs> No, indeed. Ah, bad father, bad slave, bad boy. I don't like this book one bit, friends. I leave it here. It sells for a pretty penny, but you know what? It's not worth it. Not one bit. Ah, I think three books should be enough for now. The sun is uh, heading down just a little bit going to set and whatnot, and Brandar must be on his way. To where? Hmm. Possibly Corvenjunt, but uh, very likely not. <laughs> I've been unable to find it thus far, and it doesn't leave me so hopeful for what the future holds. Oh, there's some water down here, I don't want to go this way. Please, please. Ah. Bit stuck. Here we go. Up and over. Oh, and the bear. Hello, Mr. Bear. 
Greetings to you. I know what to do with a bear. Miss? That sounds good. That sounds like a winning proposition. Always with the damn bears. Hmm. Up, up, up. What was he doing? Over here. Ah, perhaps camping in this cave, yes. That would make good sense. But there is also a fire lit near it. Quite curious. Unveil your mysteries to me, bear. Perhaps if I can lose him. To the uh, explore this cave just a little bit. Hmm? That never hurt anyone. That's right. You forget all about Brandar. And hopefully I won't forget about him while I am in here. <laughs> oh no, friends. Far too much water in here. Sorry, Brandar's not looking to get his feet wet. It's a bit too cold. Is the bear still waiting for me? Hmm. I do smell him. He's made his home here. There he is. Hello there. Is that him? If it's not, this rock seems to be shooting blood. I suppose I should leave him alone. He was uh, threatening me a bit before I entered the cave, but he seems fairly docile now. Just drinking some water or something. Ah, if I had Richard, I could easily outrun these things, you see. Ah, I was hoping he might show up while we were reading the book. Unfortunately, it was not to be. My, that is a quite a fantastic looking mud, mud crab, is it not? Hello? Anyone home? Oh. Just Mr. Mudcrab. So nice to see you. Hello there. Please lay down. My, you are a big fellow, are you not? Ah. I, I remember these things being much smaller. No? My goodness. Quite impressive what the, uh, the winds of the northern lands can do to a mud crab, hmm? What do you have in here? Salt, flour... Ah... The owner is not around. I would like to borrow this boat. But it seems uh, relatively tied to the dock. And uh, Brandar is no sort of knot maker. You know, one of my weaknesses. I would simply shred through the knot with my claws, and then uh, I would, it would be impossible to tie the boat back up. So quite rude of me to take it, I think. Yes, much better this way. Mm -hmm. Ah, I need to check out one of these signposts. See where it is exactly that I am heading. Hmm, Dragon Bridge, Solitude. Yes, I wanted to go to Solitude, but Rorikstead is this way. The fellow with the staff that I was promised. Hmm. Ah, my. Perhaps I should head to Rorikstead. Is Solitude closer? I'm quite unsure. Unfortunate. And with no horse to carry me either. Ah. At least I'm feeling a bit well rested. We have not done much since uh, leaving the Harpy. Read a few books, ducked my head into a cave, decided it was too wet. But overall, hmm, quite a relaxing day for Brandar. Oh my, is this solitude? Oh. I apologize. 
and soon you will apologize. Beg me for mercy, hmm? Close okay, that's close enough. That's fine. I'm just minding my own business here. Close She's quite threatening, is she not? I do hate dealing with the mages. They're always so full of tricks, hmm? Back off, back off. Yes, okay. I'm gone, how's that? Hmm. But I do need a bridge to get across this water. Ah, the boat would have taken me right there. Most unfortunate, friends. Hmm. There seems to be a, a small path across. Oh no. I'm not going to be able to make this jump, I think. Ah, Richard, where are you? He doesn't mind getting his feet wet for daddy. Perhaps I can find a bridge somewhere up ahead. Are there more? My goodness. Nobody is friendly in this part of the woods. At least they have not opened fire. <clears throat> I guess I should be grateful for that part. Hmm. There's a bridge. <clears throat> Just as Brandar was thinking to jump across the water. Huh. Crazy idea that would have been. Gotten a bit more used to the water on my fur. But it is especially annoying in Skyrim. Yes. My mind has expanded just a little bit from my adventures, but uh, just because I can deal with something now does not mean that I want to at any point. You see, there is a, a very small difference. Small but definite difference. Can I do it? Yes. Do I enjoy doing it? Still no. Definitely not. Oh, what is this? Hole in the ground, hole in the ground. Well, there's no hole. Hmm. I wonder what this place is. For sacrifices of some sort? To Kinoreth? Worship the woods kind of thing? One, two, three. Goodbye, goodbye, see you again Goodbye, goodbye, see you, my friends